The sun is a source of energy. As the supplies of fossil fuels coal, oil and gas are running out, scientists have been working hard trying to find ways of obtaining other kinds of fuel. They have succeeded in finding one that is very efficient, nuclear fuel, however, the ores which produce this in of energy, e.g. uranium ores, will eventually run out, too. Fortunately a source of abundant energy, which is virtually inexhaustible sunlight has been waiting for the scientist. The sun sends out energy equal to that produced by 10 million tons of coal every second, of which the earth receives only one two billionth part. It is estimated that the energy which falls no one square meter of the earth's surface per second can be used to keep about 7 100 watt lamps burning. The sun's energy is really abundant, but only a limited amount has so far been used by man. The sun can also be used as a source of fuel for power plants. Such power plants are still in the experimental stages. However, it is hoped that they will lead the way to a wider use of solar energy to run machines. Solar energy can be used in telephone communications, space technology, and farming. Solar batteries have been in experimental use for a number of years to power telephone lines. They are now being used to recharge batteries which power instruments used in space vehicles. Scientists have also succeeded in developing solar pumps that can raise water for irrigation. The sun seems to be ideal source of energy for a great many uses. Yet to change the abundant sunlight into energy is a different matter. The instruments needed to catch the sun's energy are still very expensive. However, once man succeeds in catching even a small part of that energy, nobody would worry about running out of fossil fuels or uranium ores. It lines in the hands of the scientist to make this dream come true. Marine life. The word, marine, comes from the Latin word, mare, which means, sea. Marine life means all the animal and plant species that live in the waters of the sea. The geography of the seabed, the floor of the sea, is not so different from that of the land. There are hills, high mountains, valleys, rolling plains and plateaus. Below the low tide mark, the bottom of the sea slopes gently downward to a depth of about 100 fathoms, in the form of a shelf known as the continental shelf. On the surface of the sea there are tiny floating plants and animals, including the eggs and young of larger animal and jellyfishes that are called, plankton. The plankton is important because a great many fishes feed on it. Several kinds of animals such as crabs, lobsters, shrimp, squids, octopuses, mollusci, shellfish of all kinds, anemones and sponges live on the seashore. Such animal can also be found on the continental shelf, but the animals that live in the deeper waters are usually larger. Seaweeds live in the shallow waters, not deeper than 50 fathoms as they need fairly strong sunlight to assimilate their food. In China and Japan seaweeds are eaten, ill Europe carrageen is used for thickening soup and making jellies. The really deep sea is cold and dark because the sunlight cannot penetrate the depths. The pressure in the deep sea higher than in the shallow water, and the fishes are much more fragile and delicate in appearance than those from parts of the sea where the pressure is lower. Some have large eyes and can see, but other are completely blind. We should look on the sea as a valuable source food. Fishing industries should know the location of one fish they are trying to catch, and how many can be caught without killing off the whole species. Spacecraft People had thought of building spacecraft several hundred years ago. They had thought of going to the moon and many other planets. Papers on spacecraft can be found among the papers of famous scientists who lived centuries ago. However, the craft could not be built until after World War II. It is not easy to build a spacecraft. A spacecraft needs a good rocket that is strong enough to send it to outer space. Such a motor was not developed until 1944. A spacecraft also needs as many as ren million very sophisticated parts. These parts are needed so that the craft can function well when it is flying far away from Earth. These parts must have very high precision elements. Each of them must have the right shape and the right size. Such parts could not be mowed until after 1940. Today, spacecraft are being made all the time. 
they have to be enough to carry astronauts into outer space. What does a spacecraft look like? A spacecraft usually consists of three rockets that are joined together. The three rockets are called stages. The first stage takes the spacecraft to a certain speed and then falls away. The second stage takes it to speed twice as great as the first, and then it also falls away. The third stage takes the spacecraft to its top speed of more than 38,600 km per hour. Where is the place for the astronauts? It is at the top of the spacecraft. In the nose of the third stage a capsule. In this capsule are the astronauts and the instrument package. This capsule is actually the smallest part of the ship. But all sorts of very sophisticated instruments are found into his capsule. This little capsule is the most important part of the ship. Wildlife Conversation There is reason for the deepest concern about the plight of wildlife in our country. Many rare species are threatened with extinction because of the greed of hunters' game collections. Orangutan are rarely found in their natural habitat in the forest of Kalimantan and Sumatra, but one may find them in zoo and private menageries all over the world. Ruthless hunters kill innocent elephants for their valuable ivory tusks, or catch them alive to perform in circuses. Tigers' hides decorate walls and floors of rich people's home in distant countries. If things are allowed to continue in this way, it is feared that very soon all wildlife will disappear from our forests. Fortunately, the government has now imposed strict law on hunting. Some areas are designated wildlife reserves where hunters cannot enter. These include Ujungkulan and Pangandaran in West Java, Marubadiri in East Java, and many more in the other islands. Some time ago our newspapers contained reports of elephants which had run amok in the province of Lampang. They had emerged from their abode in the forest and destroyed crops and houses belonging to the villagers. The people could not understand why the beasts had suddenly gone wild. The strange thing was that the animals had not come for food, because having wrought destruction they returned to the forest. They seemed to have come only to vent their anger. As elephants are protected by law, the people could not kill any of them. The explanation for the elephants' strange behavior is that they felt their quiet life had been disturbed by the timber felling projects and sawmills set up deep in the forest. The animals felt their domain was being narrowed by man, and so they got angry. Elephants need peace and quiet for their family life. They also need vast areas of land in which to roam. They live in herds, and each herd likes to have its own territory. Now the government has driven the elephants back into the forests, away from any village or lumber mill. By shouting and shooting in the air the people drove the great beasts to a new abode in the district of Air Sugian. It is hoped that they will feel at home there and can live in peace and quiet. Albert Einstein In 1894, when Albert Einstein was 15, his father lost money and could not support him any longer. Other boys would have left school and stopped studying. Not Albert. He left school for some time, but he later managed to go to a better school, the Polytechnic in Zurich, Switzerland. On leaving the institute he discovered that no one would offer him the kind of job he wanted. At last he found a suitable one at the patent office in Bern. Einstein's task at the patent office was to make an investigation of the new products sent to his office. The job did not require much of Einstein's new products sent to his office. The job did not require much of Einstein's time, so he was able to write scientific articles. He published these in 1905. Scientists were surprised by what he had written. They were even more surprised when they knew that these articles, when could have been written by a university professor, were actually written by an official at a patent office. Investigations were made and it was decided that the official should be taken from the patent office and given a more suitable job. A few years later, Einstein became a professor at the University of Zurich. In 1911 he taught in Prague, and later at the Polytechnic Institute in Switzerland, where he had been a student. Then he was requested to move to Berlin. Einstein stayed in Berlin for 20 years, from 1913 to 1933. During that period he worked on his famous theory of relativity. He gave a simple example in simple language, to explain the idea of relativity. A man riding on a train drops a stone out of the window. 
To the man on the train, it seems that the stone follows a straight path as it drops. However, to a man outside the train, the part of the stone does not seem straight, it looks like a parabola. The theory expands those of Newton and Galileo, which are correct, only under certain conditions. Einstein made very important contributions in the field of physics. The Nobel Prize that he won in 1912 at the of 42 was no surprise to the scientific world. No scientist beat him his field. What beat him was time. He died in Princeton in the USA in 1955. People believed that he was J the century's greatest man of science. Jakarta and other big cities. In Jakarta and other big cities in Indonesia it is common practice to use gas for cooking. Gas reaches the houses through large underground pipes called gas mains, and smaller pipes called service pipes lead to the gas meters in each hose or building. The meter records how much gas is used. Natural and gas and gas from oil has no distinctive smell, so an artificial smell is produced by adding small quantities of concentrated adurants to enable people to detect any leak that may occur. Pertamina sells bottled gas under the name of LPG. The gas is put in steel drums or cylinders. Bottled gas is used by people who live places without a pipe supply, by yachtsmen and campers. Indonesia's role in LNG production started in 1977 with the initiation of the LNG facility at Bontang. About a year later the plant at Arun also started production and exportation. Castor fuel and lye. The air we breathe contains the gases oxygen and nitrogen, and small quantities of other gases. Every gas consists of molecules of a particular substance, moving rapidly about. The molecules are comparatively far apart, but they fill evenly any vessel containing them. All gases can be changed to liquids, and some even to solids, if they are cooled down enough. The oxygen used in factories for making a very hot flame to cut and weld steel is sometimes stored and carried about in the liquid state and solid carbon dioxide, usually called dry ice, is used for keeping ice cream cold. The kinds of gases used in cookers and gas fires come from three sources. The first kind is made of naphtha, which is a light oil, the second is made from coal, while the third, natural gas, is almost entirely methane. Geologists believe that natural gas was produced iron carboniferous, or coal-bearing rocks. The gas rose into the rock holes in the sandstone, and was prevented from escaping upwards out of the sandstone by a cap, rock usually a from of rock salt which formed a dome over the natural reservoir of gas. Compulsory education and foster parents. In realization of the mission in the preamble of our constitution which urges us to raise the intelligence of nation, the government announced the beginning of a compulsory education program in Indonesia in a ceremony celebrating the Nation Education Day, on the 2nd of May 1984. The program was begun almost at the same time as the beginning of the fourth five-year development plan, 1984 to 1989. The program requires that children from 7 to 12 years age complete at least 6 years of primary education. With this compulsory education program, children of 7 to 12 years of age will have an equal opportunity to enjoy primary education throughout the country. On the occasion of celebration of International Children's Day, on the 23rd of July 1984, the government launched another scheme calling for well-to-do economically able person to become foster parent. The duty of a foster parent is to finance the children's education as well as to provide all basic requirements that the fostered children may need in their schooling such as nutritious food, school uniform and textbook. The help be given on the basic of the spirit of humanity. Once a foster parent agrees to finance a child's the foster parent should be prepared to do it at least for one years, although the ideal target is six years, that is, until the child finish his primary education. The foster parent may be an individual or a corporate body, like a foundation, social organization, business enterprise, or private social institution. The response to this scheme has been very good. Thousands of people have pledged to help finance the poor children or orphans. It is hoped that in the near future, 
Through the compulsory education and foster parent program, the intelligence of the nation will be raised. Driving safely. Like many others that we do well, safe driving begins with simple matter. It begins as soon as you sit behind the steering wheel. The first things that you should do is to get the proper seating position and the proper distance between yourself and the steering wheel. You should sit down in such a way that your shoulders rest easily again the seat. Your back should also be against the seat, not hunched forward. Move the set until your arms are straight in front of you when holding the steering wheel. Of course, you are not going to drive with your hands in the top position, but that is how you measure the proper distance. Make sure, however, that at that distance you can reach the foot pedals easily. Otherwise make the necessary adjustments to your seating position, for example by moving the seat forward bit. If it is your own car, it will be better and safer to have blocks installed on the pedals. At any rate, you should be able to sit comfortably bin the proper distance. The City of London The history of London cannot be separated from the River Thames. If you look at the map you will see that it is the gateway to London from the European continent. In the first century, when the Romans occupied England, there was a small village on Lud Hill along the Thames, where the river was at its lowest point. It was about 10 miles from the sea. The Romans discovered that they could load and unload their merchant ships here. So, they built a city on Lud Hill. More and more ships could now for either loading or unloading, bringing more and more business to the city. They called the city Londinium, meaning, city, from which the name London was probably derived. In order to connect both sides of the river, called the Thames, the Romans built the London Bridge here. A great fire in 1665 brought a big change to London. The great wall surrounding the city was destroyed and today we can only see its ruins. Another change was brought by the Second World War. From August 1940 to May 1941, German bombers attacked the city almost every night, destroying thousands of buildings, arid houses, and killing thousands of people. For the second time, the greater part of London was in ruins. Government is endeavoring. The government is endeavoring to cope with the population problem in two ways. On the one hand by encouraging people to move, either spontaneously or under the official transmigration program from densely populated Java, Madura and Bali to the wider open spaces of the outer islands of Sumatera, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Irian Jaya, and on other hand by fostering family planning. Transmigration is more than a response to population growth, it also carries profound implications for balanced national development and for national security. In its response to the population growth however, Indonesia must continue to rely upon family planning objectives, the establishment of happy and prosperous small families and the reduction of the population growth to 1% by 1990. The country's family planning can indeed offer valuable lessons for other parts of the world in terms not only of results achieved but also of the democratic way in which they have been achieved. Indonesia's family planning program has become one of the most remarkable of all attempts to institute birth control on a mass scale. Indonesia, having the world's fifth largest populations and endowed with extensive and varied natural resources, has the potential to become a great and prosperous power, but for the time being she is facing four main problems how to cope with her population's growth, how to produce enough food, how to provide people with jobs and how to organize enough exports so that the country can pay her way in the world. Indonesia's most valuable resource is her people. But for Indonesia, as with other developing countries, the possession of this particular kind of resource can prove to be a serve impediment to economic development. Water. Water is an essential component of all living matter. The body itself consists of more than 70% water. Water is necessary for weathering processes that convert rock to soil and for the transport of soil nutrients to plant. In the form of vapor, it provides protection for us against the harmful radiations from outer space and the chilling temperatures at night. Water is so much a part of our daily lives that we take all this for granted, we drink it, wash with it, use it to dispose of our waste products and for countless other domestic purposes. 
The widest use of water in some countries is for irrigation. The farmers grow rice extensively to satisfy the need for this staple food. With the programmer's priority being to increase rice production, the heavy use of water for agriculture will continue in the future. Water is also used to produce electric power. Many hydroelectric power plants provide electricity for cities, towns and villages. Industry depends on water. The manufacture of foodstuffs, textiles, man-made dams now attract more and more people for fishing, boating and other recreations. Water sources can be classified as either surface water or ground water. Surface water originates from two main sources rivers and rainfall, which act as the sources of water in urban areas. Rainwater failing on land areas partly infiltrates the Earth's surface and is partly intercepted by plants, while some evaporates. Water collected in lakes, swamps, streams and rivers can be used to provide an urban water supply. Central Bank a central bank also provides loans to its customers. But the customers are not individuals as in the case of commercial bank. The customers of central banks are governments, other commercial banks and financial institutions, a country will have one central bank. In England it is the Bank of England. In our country it is the Bank of Indonesia. The central bank often has a duty of formulating and implementing the country's monetary and credit policies, usually in cooperation with the government. For us individuals, the commercial bank is more important because it directly provides us with services. We can enjoy the services by establishing an account at the bank. There are two kind of account. One is the savings account and the other is the current account. One advantage of having a current account is that we can pay using checks. This means that we don't have to carry large amounts of money with us and risk losing it. Most banks, commercial banks, have two kinds of current accounts. One is the minimum balance account and the other is the special account. The former kind requires the customer to maintain in his account a certain amount as a minimum balance. But the bank will charge the customer a fee for each check he or she writes. Volcano in Indonesia Probably the best known volcano in Indonesia, or in the whole world for that matter, is Mount Krakatau. It erupted violently in 1883. What caused it to erupt? Or, more generally, what causes volcanoes to erupt? In order to know the answer, it is necessary for us to know what a volcano is. In Indonesian we call it, Gunung Berapi, or, Gunung Api, for short, the question is, where do the heat and fire come from? According to geologists, deep beneath the ground there are chambers, which contain molten rock. Because of high pressure, the molten rock is forced up the passage that connects the chamber and the opening in the crust of the earth. This molten rock flows out of the opening as lava, magma, and along with it is emitted ashes and gases. A volcano, then, is a mountain with an opening at the top, from which flows lava, hot ashes and gases eventually the lava cools off and becomes solid rock. Sometimes the solid rock blocks the opening and eruption stop. However, if high pressure builds up in the chamber, the blockage may reopen and the volcano erupts once more. Very often a volcanic explosion, like the 1883's explosion of Mount Krakatau, causes a great deal of human suffering. That is why people often associate volcanoes with disasters. That is not wholly correct, of course, since there are also some good things. Firstly, volcanoes, like mountain in generals, cause clouds the rise and then cool off to form rain. Secondly, the materials thrown up by volcanoes contain minerals needed by plants, after many years the volcanic materials make the soil fertile. Food Additives When we buy canned or bottled food products at the grocers or the supermarket, we will find out that there are some additives added to the main nutrients. An additives is a non-nutritive substance intentionally added to food generally in small quantities, to improve appearance, flavor, storage properties, etc. Most governments issue lists of permitted additives stating the highest acceptable concentration, defining food products in which they may be used and sometimes recommending the maximum daily consumption. Such legislation is revised periodically, and product may be added to or deleted from permitted lists because of additional scientific knowledge and experience of their use.
A group of food additives includes vitamins, amino acids, and minerals which are added to foodstuffs to compensate for losses occurring during processing or to provide additional sources in diet that might otherwise be deficient in such nutrients. Examples of their use include enrichment of margarine with the addition of vitamin A, and niacin amide to flour or bread. Salt often has a small amount of iodine to it to avoid it a diet deficiency that can cause goiter development. Appearance is an important factor in food appeal, and legislation in most countries permits the addition of both natural and synthetic coloring matter based on the coloring standards issued by the Food and Agriculture Organization FAO, and World Health Organization WHO. Flavoring materials are added to basic foodstuff to provide a characteristic product flavor or to supplement or modify the original flavor. Most flavoring materials are still of natural origin, but progress in organic chemistry has made it possible to analyze flavoring materials and to synthesize products similar with those found in nature. Flavor can also be influenced by the addition of the flavor enhancer such as monosodium glutamate which intensifies perception of flavoring. Oil. That oil has helped to shape the world is not an exaggeration. Indeed. The discovery of oil during the last hundred years has changed a great deal of things. An oil product called kerosene has replaced firewood in the kitchen of our cities. Motor vehicles using gasoline or diesel oil have put animal-drawn carriages into museums. Steamships have lost against motor vehicles. Diesel locomotives have driven steam locomotives off the rails. Jet planes using aviation fuel fly the skies, making remote places reachable in a matter of hours. That oil is indispensable to our everyday lives is not an exaggeration, either. Yet few of us ever ask how this important liquid is extracted from the earth and changed into finished products. In the first place, it is not an easy matter to find an oil reserve. Exploration teams, sent by oil companies, have to go to remote places, find sometimes have to live under harsh conditions, to explore the earth or seabed for oil. They study the rock and the soil, and if they're a promising result, the next thing for the oil company to do is to send a drilling team to the location. Again, this not a simple matter. Roads, for examples, have to be built first to transport the men and materials to the site. What is worse, the first drilling does not always bring about oil. The drilling team often has to drill up to 10 wells before oil is found. Riding your bicycle. When you are riding your bicycle in the street and you came to a corner, you must watch the traffic policeman carefully. He will tell you what you can and cannot do. When he is holding up his right arm, all traffic must stop. When he is holding his right arm out to his side, the traffic which is coming from in front of him must stop. When he is raising his arm up and letting it down again, the traffic from his right side may continue again. When he is holding his hand toward you, you must stop. In these and other ways, the traffic policemen help the traffic to move quickly. Contagious diseases. Contagious diseases are which are passed from person to person. They can be passed by direct contact, or be bacteria in the air. Some diseases are very dangerous and these can spread quickly, causing sickness and sometimes death. In the 14th century in Europe, a contagious disease is called bubonic plague, or black death, killed millions people. No one knew how it spreads and they could not stop it. Today, a contagious disease like bubonic plague can be stopped by modern medicine, but at the time, nobody understood how diseases were spread or what caused them. Even this century there have been outbreaks of serious contagious diseases such as typhoid, yellow fever and cholera. Doctors and scientists have studied these diseases can prevent them if medicine is available. Unfortunately, many countries are crowded and disease spreads quickly. When this happens this is called an epidemic. Even today doctors and modern medicine sometimes cannot stop epidemics until many people have already died. Forest. Forest the oldest and most diverse ecosystem are important for their products. They also keep soil fertile ensure the supply of constant water under the ground, regulate the climate and prevent floods. The leaves which have fallen to the ground become some kind of substance. 
This substance which is called humus is a fertilizer to the soil. Humus holds rain water during the wet season, stores it and then waters the fields in the dry season. Thus the fields can produce more crops. For years many people haven't been obeying the government's regulations and have been cutting down the trees excessively. As a result, thousands of hectares of what used to be good forest lands have become waste. These people are not aware that without forest nothing prevents the water will wash away the soil to the river. It may cause floods which will destroy the farmland and villages. For all this reason, the State Minister of Development, Supervision and Environment has consistently been trying to keep on asking our people to stop destroying the forest and conducting the campaign for forest conservation. What is global warming? Global warming is a term used to describe a gradual increase in the Earth's average ground and atmospheric temperatures across the whole planet. Measurements indicate that the global temperature has increased by about 1 degree Fahrenheit in the past century. This warming trend appeared during a period when human activities were beginning to increase the carbon dioxide, CO2, and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Although most scientists believe that a rise in carbon dioxide emissions will lead to further global warming, uncertainties remain about the timing and severity of resulting climatic change. Nevertheless, many are convinced that human activities are partly responsible for the long-term warming of the past century and that climatic changes caused by greenhouse gas increases will be a continuing part of our future. The impact of global warming could be devastating. Global warming causes ozone depletion, melting polar ice, and rising ocean levels. The ozone layer, which protects all life from ultraviolet UV radiation, is being destroyed by the release of chlorofluorocarbons CFCs, into the atmosphere. The widening holes in the ozone layer allow in more UV rays, which can cause skin cancers, cataracts, and immune system damage. UV rays are detrimental to pollination, seed production, and marine life food supplies as well. Ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean have receded to record lows, and Antarctic glaciers are melting at a fast rate, causing sea levels to rise and indigenous wildlife to lose its habitat. Rising ocean levels could eventually cause worldwide flooding of coastal areas, forcing people and wildlife to migrate inland. Many experts predict global warming will cause a dramatic increase in excessive rainfall in some areas severe drought in others, resulting in floods, crop failures, and a rising number of forest fires and landslides. Many of the world's most knowledgeable climate change scientists forecast that the Earth's temperature will rise from 1.44 to 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100 if we don't take steps to reduce greenhouse gases. An increase of 1 to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will occur even if we do act, because many gases have already been released. Ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean have receded to record lows, and Antarctic glaciers are melting at a fast rate, causing sea levels to rise and indigenous wildlife to lose its habitat. Rising ocean levels could eventually cause worldwide flooding of coastal areas, forcing people and wildlife to migrate inland. Many experts predict global warming will cause a dramatic increase in excessive rainfall in some areas and severe drought in others, resulting in floods, crop failures, and a rising number of forest fires and landslides. Many of the world's most knowledgeable climate change scientists forecast that the Earth's temperature will rise from 1.44 to 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100 if we don't take steps to reduce greenhouse gases. An increase of 1 to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will occur even if we do act, because many gases have already been released. Behavior and Work Habits in the Workplace Smart and quiet behavior in the workplace can cause serious or even fatal accidents. Behavior like this is called horseplay. If you interfere with the work of others or make practical joking, it can also be very safe. Horseplay, running, and throwing objects in the workplace are good work habits and can cause accidents. Bad work habits keep a workplace dangerous. A dangerous worker is messy in his habits. He keeps a messy bench in a messy store. The floor around the bench or machine is never dirty. He always puts rubbish and waste into the wrong bins. In this way, 
he prevents obstruction of fire. A dangerous worker does not wait for accident to happen. He never takes actions after they happen. If he sees some oil on the floor, he does not leave it there. Somebody may slip on that oil and so he wipes it up. He does not leave tools lying around or on top of machines. Tools can fall into the moving parts of a machine. The machine may be damaged, or the operator may be badly injured. The dangerous worker does these things through habits. As he works, he is thinking of the safety. He is trying to remove the safety. He is thinking not only of himself, but also of his fellow workers. Dear Jude. How are you, my friend? I'm really sorry I couldn't send you an email earlixer. I'm really busy with my final exam preparation. I have to read a lot of books. Besides that, I must attend extra classes for English and science every afternoon and go to the gym at weekends. I really thank you for hosting me during my holiday. It was the best holiday I've ever had. I'm really grateful that I finally could travel to England and explore the famous places over there with you. I can't stop seeing our pictures during the trips. It's really fun to remember our good time together. Jude, I'd love to spend my holiday with you again. Will you come to visit me during your summer holiday? I will have finished my exam and therefore I can take you to interesting and historical places in my city and other neighboring areas. I'm sure we will have a lot of fun, too. I'm very excited about this. Please let me know soon. Thanks again. For your kindness. Melody. Bandung my hometown, is a very interesting place. If you like shopping, you can visit Dago and Sihampelas. In those area, there are so many factory outlets, which apparently attract many Jakarta people who like to shop. These shops are popular for their cheap price. If you go to upper part of Dago, you will see lots of cafes too. These cafes are famous because you can enjoy tasty food and Bandung beautiful view at the same time. The air is cold and fresh, because there is no factory nearby and very limited number of cars, just like in the old days. Another place that you can visit is Lembong. It is located a little bit outside the Bandung city and famous for the cold air, which is perfect for holidays. Lembong is also famous for cow's milk baked sticky rice, and also strawberry plantations. In the strawberry plantations, you can pick and eat any strawberries you want for some amount of monsi that you have to pay. You can also eat some foods made from strawberries. The strawberry plantations cause more and more tourists to come to Bandung. Besides that, Bandung is also famous for the tea plantations and the mountains such as Tankuban Prahu and Kawaputa. Apart from that, Bandung is also famous for its schools. Bandung has a lot of other interesting aspects too, such as various foods and cultural products. I have got an unforgettable experience last Lebaron day. My family and I went to my mother's hometown to celebrate, Idol Fitri. We went by aeroplane. At the airport, my family and I had to walk through the metal detector. When I got the turn to walk through it, suddenly the alarm beeped. The woman who worked as the airport security said, come here, you need to get your belt off. I took my belt off, but the alarm still beeped. The security asked me to take my wallet from my pocket. I did what she ordered. Still, the alarm beeped. After that the security asked me to turn back and she checked my body. She touched my left pocket. Then she told me, there was something in it. It might be the thing that made the alarm beeped. I took out something from the left pocket. The woman laughed and said, that has made the alarm beep. It was a silver pen. I felt embarrassed because Eve Bod stared at me with curiosity. My holiday to Bali. I was in Senio's high school when I went to Bali Island for the first time. I went there with my teacher and my friends. It was our school study tour. My teacher, my classmates, and I were in the same bus. We left our school at 8 a.m. The journey from Patti to Bali took one day. I was so exhausted because I had to sit along the journey. Actually, it was an enjoyable journey because I spent time with my friends. We did many things together, like playing games, laughing, and joking. I was tired but I didn't mind. All of my treadness was gone when we arrived at the Sanner Beach, where our hotel was located. It was still early momming. We saw a beautiful sunrise. 
After watching the sunrise, we were driven to the hotel to take a rest and to have meals. After that, we went to the Nusa Dua beach. There were so many activities to do there, like parasailing, banana boat, and so on. But, I chose to go to a little island which had a lot reptile. There were snakes, turtles, etc. The scenery was so beautiful because it was in the middle of the sea. Next, we went to Garuda Wizanu Kenkana, GWK. There were two amazing statues. They were Wizanu and his bird, called Garuda. After a very long journey, through the land and the sea, we finally got back to the hotel. Although we tired, we all happy. We could not wait to visit other beautiful places. What are thunder and lightning? Lightning is a sudden, violent flash of electricity between a cloud and the ground, or from cloud to cloud. A lightning flash, or bolt, can be several miles long, it is so hot, with an average temperature of 34,000 centigrade, that the air around it suddenly expands with a loud blast. This is the thunder we hear. Lightning occurs in hot, wet storms. Moist air is driven up to a great height. It forms a type of cloud called cumulonimbus. When the cloud rises high enough, the moisture freezes and ice crystals and snowflakes are formed. These begin to fall, turning to rain on the way down. This rain meets more moist air rising, and it wants the friction between them which produces static electricity. When a cloud is fully charged with this electricity, it discharges it as a lightning flash. Gawai Day or Gawai Dayak Gawai Day or Gawai Dayak is a festival celebrated in Sarawak, it is both a religious and social occasion. Gawai Dayak literally means, Dayak Festival. Dayak visit their friends and relatives on this day. Those far away receive greeting cards. The mode of celebrations varies from place to place. The festival is celebrated on the 1st of June every year, however, it actually starts on the evening of 31% of May. Gawai Dayak celebration may last for several days. On the evening of 31st of May, the ceremony to cast the greediness spirit away, Mul Antu Rua, is held. Then, offering ceremony, Miring, is conducted. Thanking good for the good harvest, guidance, blessings and long life is done through sacrificing a cockerel. At midnight spirit welcoming procession, Nalu Patera, is held. Then, the celebration gets merrier as people start singing and reading poems. On the 1% of June, the homes of the Dayaks are open to visitors. Cockfighting, blowpipe skill demonstration, and Najat competitions are held. It is also during this time of the year that many Dayak weddings take place. Today, it is an integral part of Dayak social life. It is a Thanksgiving day marking good harvest and a time to plan for the new farming season or activities ahead. Kangaroo A kangaroo is an animal found only in Australia, although it has a smaller relative, called a wallaby, which lives on the Australian island of Tasmania and also in New Guinea. Kangaroos eat grass and plants, they have short front legs, but very long, and very strong back legs and a tail. These are used for sitting up and for jumping. Kangaroos have been known to make forward jumps of over 8 meters, and leap across fences more than 3 meters high. They can also run at speeds of over 45 kilometers per hour. The largest kangaroos are the great gray kangaroo and the red kangaroo, adults gross to a length of 1.60 meters and weigh 90 kilos. Kangaroos are marsupials. This means that the female kangaroo has an external pouch on the front of her body. A baby kangaroo is very tiny when it is born, and it crawls at once into this pouch where it spends its first five months of life. Antibiotic Antibiotic is a drug produced by certain microbes. Antibiotics destroy other microbes that damage human tissues. They are used to treat a wide variety of diseases, including gonorrhea, tonsillitis and tuberculosis. Antibiotics are sometimes called wonder drugs, because they can cure diseases such as meningitis, pneumonia and scarlet fever. But when the antibiotics are overused, are misused. These drugs make a person sensitive being attacked by a superbug. Antibiotics do not always distinguish between harmless and dangerous microbes. If a drug destroys too many harmless microorganisms, 
the pathogenic ones the dangerous microbes will have a greater chance to multiply. This situation often leads to the development of a new infection called suprainfection. Extensive use of some antibiotics may damage organs and tissues. For example, streptomycin, which is used to treat tuberculosis, has caused kidney damage and deafness. Resistance to antibiotics may be acquired by pathogenic microbes. The resistant microbes transfer genetic material to non-resistant microbes and cause them to become resistant. During antibiotic treatment, non-resistant microbes are destroyed, but resistant types survive and multiply. To avoid the side effect of antibiotics, you'd better not urge your doctor to prescribe antibiotics. Keep in mind that antibiotics are only useful for bacterial infections and have no effect on viruses, so they cannot be used for chicken pox, measles, and other viral diseases. The Japanese Traditional House the Japanese traditional house made of wood is expected to last about 20 years before having to be repaired or rebuilt. Each year it is depreciated. The interior design is what really sets the Japanese traditional house. With the exception of the entryway, genkin, the kitchen, daidokuro, the bathing room, sento, and the toilet, benjo, the rooms in a Japanese traditional house does not have a designated use. A room can easily be a living area, a bedroom, a dining room or any combination. Large rooms are partitioned by fusuma, sliding doors made of wood and thick paper. The paper used for fusuma is called washi. These sliding doors can be removed whenever a larger space is needed. In yard traditional houses, there was one large room, or ima, living space, that could be divided as needed. The smaller rooms like kitchen, Bath and toilet were small extensions to one side. Ruka, or wooden floored hallways, follow the edge of the home. Windows are made of wood and shoji paper, which is thin enough to let the light shine through. Even Japanese modern houses tend to have one traditional Japanese room, called a washitsu. This room has tatami mats on the floor as used in Japanese traditional house. Tatami are thick straw mats covered with stitched, woven rushes. Tatami are smooth and firm enough to walk on, while making a sleeping surface more comfortable than wood or stone. The Genkin is usually a step below the level of the rest of the house. When people enter the home, they leave their shoes in the Genkin, pointed toward the door so they only need to slip them on when they are ready to go out. Indoor shippers are often worn inside the house. The kitchen in most traditional Japanese homes will contain a stove with a very small oven and broiler and an electric refrigerator. Counter space for food preparation and a sink are also located in the kitchen. The bathing room contains a tub and is often waterproof. An adjacent area is available for showering. The Japanese reuse bathwater, either for other bathers or for washing laundry, so it is important not to dirty the water with soap and dirt. Dirty portions of the body can be washed before stepping into the bath. Let's make the city clean.